Hi again, Ashka here. And Ningu here. And welcome to the third lecture in the basics of library and information science, information infrastructures. What comes to mind when you think of a classification system? For a lot of us, it might be library books on shelves and tagged with numbers. Maybe it's how we organize our music tracks and photos. Or maybe it's about how you identify an animal or a plant in the wild. In this class, we think of classification systems as part of a broader concept called information systems. And these systems make an important contact point between library science and information science, bringing them together into the LIS field as we know today. Information systems not only include physical collections and lists of names, but they also concern how we divide the continuous, ambiguous real world into discrete entities and design the abstract structures of collection and organization. Besides, research around information systems also studies how we make things accessible, that is, information retrieval, and how we actively look for information, that is, information seeking. Beyond these technical aspects, information systems are also important infrastructures that have very real social impacts, and we will talk about those too in this lecture and the next ones. To understand how information infrastructures came into existence, we need to first understand why we need them. This brings us back, again, to modern or contemporary times. The idea of classifying things itself is not new. We as humans have always needed to say some things belong together while other things belong in other groups. So we know, for example, that these fruits are safe to eat while others will poison you. We need to be able to identify the similarities and differences between things. This is a very basic function of our neural systems, and as each of us learned to group things together from a very young age, this became more and more important in our lives. As we grow, we start to form more complicated and better developed concepts. These go beyond obvious differences and become finer social constructions like community belonging, understanding of cultural genres, linguistic boundaries, gender construction, race and ethnicity, and so on. This is also when certain concepts start to become highly arbitrary and only get naturalized because we are constantly soaked and embedded in certain cultures. On one hand, knowing how to group things mean we hopefully won't eat the wrong things and die. On the other hand, we can also fall into traps like stereotypes, compartmental thoughts, and binary thinking. There are a lot of complications that require us to keep learning, unlearning, and relearning basic cultural differentiations. During modern times, the need to finally differentiate things and people intensified. According to Ian Hacking, a Canadian philosopher studying the history and philosophy of statistical science, this change came to European countries around the 18th century. With the rise of capitalism, industries, and modern cities, people, specifically managers and major stakeholders, not only needed clearer distinctions between different groups, but they wanted to calculate each of their values, risks, costs, and outcomes in this fast-running, well-calculated industrial machine. One prominent example here is the rise of the insurance industry, where companies carefully evaluate the statistical risks and costs to make profit. This kind of work calls for systemic classification and precise documentation. Classification systems differ from our rough understandings of differences and groups. Our personal understandings are flexible and subjective. You don't have to agree with someone else's categories, and the categories don't have to be precise or fixed. Classification systems, on the other hand, are shared among huge groups of people. To keep up with modern capitalist forms of production, they have to stay relatively stable, and they classify things or people in a very rigid manner. This results in the creation of, for example, an elaborate but also deeply problematic system of mental illness that finally divides the human neural spectrum. Such systems and their legacies are long-lasting. To take a basic example here, homosexuality has been classified as a mental disease for decades. This is until the American Psychological Association removed it from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the Mental Disorders, or DSM, in 1973. And it's not until 1990 that the World Health Organization finally removed homosexuality 
from the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD. And up to today, these classification standards still face constant debate, and they need to be updated constantly to reflect our understanding of what is a disease and what is not. Even with its problems, this kind of classifactory thinking forms a basis of information infrastructures across all works of life. As publication and documentation grew and later exploded in scale, libraries, government bodies, businesses, and almost all organizations needed to keep up and make sure records were precise, well-maintained, and usable. And later, as electronic machines took over the manual labor of record keeping, library systems and record keeping systems alike needed to adjust to new technologies, eventually resulting in the creation of iSchools, aka library and information schools, between the late 1980s and early 2000s. Here's another example, the Library of Congress subject heading system. This is a standard classification system used in almost all university and research libraries in the United States. Today, it is built into the library's computer systems, known as machine-readable cataloging, or MARC systems, for managing inventories, finding books, and circulating them. The subject heading system is very well documented with detailed, strict hierarchical structures and a quite abstract numbering system. If people ever need to change the system, the revision process would take years to complete and necessarily involve groups of professional librarians and library policymakers around the same table. This system is obviously not the way you would organize your own bookshelf, yet it is built into almost every published book in the United States. Usually on the copyright information page of a book, you can find the Library of Congress Cataloging in Publication Information, or CIP information. It influences where you can find certain books in the library, and whether some books are put together or apart, it may even influence whether a library will buy books assigned to a certain topic. As Hacking argued, and as the above examples show, in modern times, classification systems and statistical categories have become very high stakes and also very widely used. They have become part of culture and our everyday language and heavily influence the way societies operate. Sometimes they seem to be the only way that we can understand the world and our own lives. This is not to say that differences in human bodies or non-human materials did not exist until modern times, but in the past, classification systems were more rudimentary and survival-oriented. These days, classification systems can force everyone to think and work within pigeonholed narratives. Now, you might have to pick a side. Are you male or female? Are you a citizen of this country or that country? Are tomatoes a fruit or a vegetable? Is this building for commercial use or household use? Is this book a science textbook or a novel? Any choices that we make may affect how someone or something moves through the intricate structures of capitalist production, market exchange, and social control. At this point, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how information infrastructure works. Now let's take a minute to think about how it's enacted. In our reading from Virginia Eubanks' book, Automated Inequality, we go through an example from Indiana where the state automates much of its system for family and social service administration. However, the implementation of that system was severely flawed. The Indiana FSSA was established in 1991 as a way to centralize human services at the state level. It houses eight very important services, including family resources like SNAP or food stamps, Medicaid policy and planning, disability services, mental health and addiction services, aging services, learning for early childhood, such as preschool, social security, disability, and income, and a 211 helpline. Clearly, the FSSA provides and gatekeeps a lot of very important services that are crucial to the life of many Hoosiers. In the 2000s, the state decided to redo their existing FSSA system and revamp how the system was managed. It became much more centralized, much more automated, and much less work lived with caseworkers or social workers or just people. How did the process work? The state established a centralized document processing center in Grant County, Indiana, where millions of copies of driver's licenses, social security cards, and other documents were faxed. However, a lot of these documents disappeared and people started calling the center the Black Hole in Marion, which is a city in Grant County. 
Documents were supposed to be attached or indexed to digital case files. However, each month, the number of case files that weren't indexed increased exponentially. In December 2007, court documents say, 11,000 documents were unindexed. By February 2009, over 280,000 documents had disappeared, which is a huge dramatic change. If you think about how even one missing document could mean that someone didn't get food stamps or access to preschool, for example, the consequences of these gaps are astounding. People did lose their benefits, couldn't access healthcare, and ran out of medication. Human caseworkers are constrained by human limits, such as time, energy, and capacity. They can be appealed to by outside interests. At the same time, centralization of some very important services like SNAP and Medicaid clearly had flaws in its information system, in some cases with life-changing consequences. Who fills the gaps when these systems break or stops working? Now that we know the importance of the broader concept in information structure, let's hone in to look at the actual engineering of information systems. This particular area of research is called information seeking and retrieval, or ISNR. To be more precise, it contains two fields, information seeking, IS, and information retrieval, IR. IS and IR are closely related, but also take different approaches. Think of them as two sides of the same coin. To put IS and IR in very rough terms, information seeking is the user side, studying how people look for information, while information retrieval is a system side, studying how to make things useful and accessible for people. Traditionally, IS also tends to focus more on the everyday behaviors of ordinary users, while IR tends to be more focused on professional management and algorithms. But of course, the practice here is has a lot of low overlap and crossover between the two. Information seeking is part of the broader field of behavioral science, in this case more specifically referring to information behavior. At some point, we have all engaged in information seeking. For example, you are an information seeker every time you do a Google search, type something into a library search engine, or go online shopping and filter for a specific size, price, or style. A lot of theories of information seeking behavior focus on ELIS, or everyday life information seeking. When people study information seeking, they can be looking at how people plan to search for information, the barriers to those searches, how people understand what they're finding, and the factors that inform why people are searching in the first place, to name a few. There are several theories that inform information seeking, and we're not going to be able to get through all of them in this class. Today, we're going to look at just a few big ones, sense making, information poverty, information marginalization, and life in the round, and berry picking. Sense making, a theory from Brenda Durbin, a former communication professor at Ohio State University, refers to how people understand or make sense of information. When people make sense of information, they relate new information to the existing information that they already have. Makes a lot of sense. Durbin calls this process verbing, and it describes how searches are active. When people find new information, they have to do more with it to actually link new concepts to old pre-existing ones. It helps to think about sense-making as a process, and when you're studying sense-making, to think about studying how people use and understand information after they find it. Life in the Round and Information Poverty are theories developed by Elfrida Chapman, who was a professor at Sills in the 80s, actually. Chapman was an ethnographer who studied marginalized or outsider populations, including janitors, people in a retirement home, and women inmates in prison. Life in the Round refers to people who live in a small world or a world characterized by a community where people have shared beliefs. This theory considers the role of outside influences in our lives and the conditions under which new information can be integrated, noting that new information requires thoughtful consideration relative to the existing life in the round. There are four key concepts in a life in the round as described by Chapman, small worlds, social norms, worldview, and social types. 
A small world understanding is essential to the life in the round because it establishes insiders within that world who set boundaries on behavior. In the case of a prison, for example, this could be people who have been in prison for longer periods of time relative to newer inmates, could be guards and other prison staff, but it's not likely to be that new inmate. Social norms can also force a private behavior to be judged or scrutinized publicly. It is the public group that decides if a behavior, including information-seeking behavior, is appropriate or not. In Chapman's example, if you're a female prisoner, it is the norms of the prison that determine appropriate behavior, not necessarily the outside world. As a consequence of behavioral norms, we have the creation of a worldview. This worldview includes things like languages, values, meanings, symbols, and a context that holds the word worldview within temporal boundaries. For most of us, a worldview is played out as a life in the round. When our lives work for us, most of the time, we are going to take our worldviews for granted and not question them. It's important to note that people who live a life in the round are not necessarily going to seek information outside their small world. So when are people prompted to find new information? Chapman argues that people do this when two conditions are met. First, the information a person is looking for has to be something that they see as important. And second, there has to be a collective expectation that the information is relevant. Last, there has to be a perception that the life lived in the round is not functioning anymore. We're only motivated to break out of the life in the round, according to Chapman, if something isn't working, and if that something that isn't working is important to us. Information poverty is a theory Chapman established after studying janitors, single mothers, and an aging community. Chatman presented six main principles of information poverty, which we are quoting here. First, people who are defined as information poor perceive themselves to be devoid of any sources that might help them. Second, information poverty is partially associated with class distinction. That is, the condition of information poverty is influenced by outsiders who withhold privileged access to information. Third, information poverty is determined by self-protective behaviors which are used in response to social norms. Fourth, both secret, secrecy and deception are self-protecting mechanism due to a sense of mistrust regarding the interest or ability of others to provide useful information. Fifth, a decision to risk exposure about our true problem is often not taken due to a perception that negative consequences outweigh benefits. And last, new knowledge will be selectively introduced to the information world of poor people. A condition that influences this process is the relevance of that information in response to everyday problems and concerns. Information poverty has evolved today to also include information marginalization. You can find some really great work on information marginalization from former SEALS professor Dr. Amelia Gibson and PhD student John Martin. In their work on information marginalization, they build on information poverty to point out that we also have to consider the systemic factors that influence information poverty. By studying the mothers of people with either Down syndrome or autism, Gibson and Martin demonstrated that the mothers are not necessarily information poor due to the factors they can control. Rather, and this is a direct quote, information marginalization refers to the systemic, interactive social techno technical processes that can push and hold certain groups of people at social margins, where their needs are persistently ignored or overlooked. In the case of these mothers, their children have diagnoses that are pushed to the margins. These mothers may want information, but they also have to push against systemic biases to do so. In this sense, information marginalization is a compl complement to information poverty. This systemic context leads us to another theory, berry picking. Berry picking theory is developed by Marcia Bates, a professor emerita at UCLA, using picking berries in real life as a metaphor for information seeking. When you pick a berry, you are searching in a way that also depends on the plants you are picking from. The quantity of berries may change based on weather patterns or based on factors like spatial arrangement of the plants. In the same way, Bates argues that information seekers only find information in bits and pieces. 
we can't just use one search to find, find all the information we are looking for on a given topic. And we can only follow the clues we are given from search A to figure out what to look for in search B. We are iterating our searches as we go, in the same way that we would weave from one berry plant to another based on how sparse or rich the berries may be. The last thing we're going to touch on in information seeking is the concept of data voids, or places where information doesn't exist to be found. A data void exists when a search engine query turns up something with very few results or no results at all. In most cases, this can happen when a query is very niche or not looked for very often. Data voids are problematic because, once identified by bad actors, they can be exploited to then expose people to problematic information, like misinformation or disinformation. There are some data voids that are pretty harmless. However, if a data void is set up in advance of a certain type of event by a bad actor, then when a breaking news event happens or a bad actor finds a new term that has a void and exploits social biases around it, a lot more people can wind up in the void, which is now filled with problematic information, which can in turn affect their berry picking and sense making processes. Golbieski and Boyd identify five different scenarios for data voids in a paper for Data and Society. According to them, data voids can be exploited around breaking news events, the creation of strategic new terms, outdated terms, fragmented or broken up concepts, and problematic queries. Data voids are just one example of the consequences that information seeking can have on the real world and our lives. Unsurprisingly, given its scope, there are a lot of offshoots of information seeking. At its core, information seeking asks questions about information behavior, so it touches on lots of questions about how people find and perceive information, how they make decisions based on that information, the sources that they do or don't trust, and the ways in which information is made available to them. That last point touches on information retrieval. It's important to remember that theories of information seeking also inform our theories and approaches to information retrieval and vice versa. So now on to information retrieval, or IR. IR studies how systems retrieve information resources relevant to users' information needs. This is not just matching keywords or searching meta metadata, it's about how to formalize what people want and transform the human needs into structured systemic languages and machine functions. Traditionally, information retrieval deals with text. Research works usually assume your system is like a library, an article database, a bunch of web pages, an email archive, etc. Very roughly speaking, they assume you have this limited set of articles, and when a user comes in with their information need, they will find a particular subset of articles that are clearly useful, while the rest of it clearly irrelevant. When the user queries the system, the system will do its best to guess what the user needs, and of course, its return results will always be a mix of useful and useless entries. Based on these assumptions, IR researchers can count how many useful results the system finds and also how many useful results it missed out. Respectively, these two aspects are measured by what we call precision and recall. And there are of course more complex, fancier measurements that evaluates, for example, whether the most relevant entries are on the top of the result list, or things like that. These measurements allow researchers to quantitatively decide how good or effective a system is. Again, this is just a very rough overview of traditional information retrieval. Research topics in IR today not only cover information filtering, but also things like document summarization, document clustering or categorization, question answering, recommending systems, and cross-language retrieval. In other words, IR covers not only classical searching, per se, but also shortening and summarizing text, assigning subjects and category tags, answering natural language questions with bots, voice assistants, and chat AIs, recommending relevant things or things of interest, and translating and multi-language searching are also part of it. Its evaluation method also spans more than counting relevant entries, but covers small group user studies, large-scale user interaction tracking, usage data analysis, test dataset, and so on.
Let's get into a bit more technical detail here. There are many different ways to do something like a search, not just like a Google style search box. And in information science, we usually divide these different algorithmic techniques into two big camps, Boolean and Bayesian. What we usually call Boolean logic will tag everything very clearly and just search according to tags. So for example, if we search specifically for things with customer reviews above four stars, or if we filter out specific brands, then the system will filter its results pretty rigidly according to those criteria. In some systems, you may even combine those criteria to make composite ones, like I want ceiling fans or standing fans, but not fancy blades fans and I only want products that can deliver to me fast because it's very hot outside. These are all types of Boolean logic. If you've studied logics, basic programming, or discrete math, you probably have already seen these and, or, not, or, blah, blah kind of logical operations. They are all called Boolean operators and they base themselves on the logic that either you are a part of a group or you are not a part of a group. Then the operators combine the groups differently. These are also the basic pieces of logic that computers work on today. But Boolean operations can't cover all the search functions that we use in society. When we search for products, they're usually ranked by relevance. We also see machine recommendations like people often buy these together or these may be alternatives to consider, or you may also like those instead. Outside of product catalogs, AI recommendations and predictions are everywhere these days. Less prominently, you have smartphone keyboards that predict your next words, that make auto corrections when you're typing. More prominently, you also have AI systems that are being used in medical research, city management, and that can generate real looking images and text. These types of searches and recommendations rely on statistical possibilities and patterns, which is what we call Bayesian inference, a mathematical technique to calculate the most possible result given a known condition. A naive Bayes classifier of books, for example, can look at individual words that appear in books and count how many times a book with a certain word falls into a certain category. The algorithm will then take in historical data of books with human assigned categories and find statistical relations. After that, if you give the algorithm any new books, it can look up all the characteristic words in that book. Based on that, it will calculate which category this new book most likely belongs to, basically mimicking historical patterns of how people have assigned categories. This pattern finding and pattern mimicking technique is an old statistical tool, but it still serves as a very basic underlying logic behind a lot of cutting edge AI systems today. Compared to Boolean logic, Bayesian inference is much more flexible in its classification boundaries, but it is also very bulky and opaque in the actual implementation because now we can't really tell the exact logic or trails or thought processes that the machine is following, and individual users can't really control or fine tune much about a pre existing algorithm because it's trained on thousands of entries of historical data. And on the development side of this type of process, making these algorithms also needs huge amounts of pre-structured data. And that's why data set tagging, user data surveillance, and data scraping can be new, potentially exploitative forms of the internet economy. As we discussed in Automated Inequality, information systems almost always reflect and even propagate problems in other walks of life. These systems are just like any other kind of infrastructures, like roads and buildings, or legal systems and government structures. People, and especially people with economic and political power, collectively made the systems and designed them. So the systems way oversize individual human beings and what they can personally control. And these systems create huge multi-aspect social impacts on both that are both good and bad that can last for generations. As said, Bayesian system, that is almost all AI systems today, rely on huge amounts of historical data to train and work. That very fundamental logic results in various ethical issues like labor exploration, misuse or abuse, and language gap. A few weeks before we record this lecture, Adobe, the leading software company making professional creative tools like Photoshop and Premiere Pro, 
ignited a huge ongoing wave of artist protest and cancellation. This all started when Adobe added a clause to its term of use that says Adobe may access, view, or listen to user content through both automated and manual methods. And like, like most user agreements, there's no way to opt out of this. This is immediately alarming because of its AI and the text, and over the recent years, Adobe has been steadily and increasingly catering to its business interests and corporate customers, rather than artists and creators who make the actual creative works with Adobe software. And Adobe's generative AI projects constantly overstep to require artists to give out their rights for AI training when selling their contents on, on Adobe platforms. The technological thinking that AI can and will replace human beings in making art, it both diminishes artists' labors and it ignores the complexity of artistic creativity on a very basic level. Knowing that Bayesian logics are fundamentally about finding and repeating previous patterns in human behaviors, we here want to encourage you to see and confront the problems of AI technologies throughout these lectures. The cutting edge, new, and shiny technologies do not always reflect the best of human thinking. In fact, in some cases, they may even reflect ignorant, superficial understanding of arts and cultures, as well as profit-pursuing corporate interests. AI systems are very prominent today, notably used at companies like Adobe, OpenAI, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. There are a wide array of benefits to AI, but also some pretty significant issues. As Ling Yu mentioned, we have issues notably around intellectual property and ownership for people like writers, artists, and creators. When they create content that is scraped as training data for AI, what happens to their intellectual property rights? Are they getting recognized or getting credit or getting paid for this work? Beyond that, almost all AI systems heavily re rely on outsourced human workers to sort, clean, and tag their training data. We often think about automated content moderation, but behind the scenes there are human moderators who spend countless hours reviewing violent, abusive, hateful, and harmful content to ideally prevent it from spreading. This process, perhaps inevitably, is harmful for their mental health, and human content moderators do not often have the support or resources to address the strain on their lives. Furthermore, it's important to remember that the internet is mostly comprised of a few prominent languages, English, Mandarin Chinese, and Hindi. As a result, AI test systems tend to perform badly in languages that are less omnipresent on the internet, which can wind up recreating patterns from English, Mandarin, and Hindi in representations of those mid to low resource languages. This can affect translations and affect the ways that these less prominent languages are represented. For example, AI-generated Cantonese can make mistakes that are common when native speakers of Mandarin are trying to learn Cantonese. AI-generated Italian can sound like an English speaker. There are also issues of exclusion because of the lack of language representation on the internet. Very low resource languages, such as indigenous languages, have very limited text available on the internet, which in turn means that corporate AI models almost always leave them out. So, we have covered a lot of grounds today. We've talked about information infrastructure as a bridge between LS and IS and the rise of information systems in the modern world. We have also talked about information retrieval and seeking as key components of this connection. Think of them as two sides of the same coin, helping us organize, find, and understand the information. And we have talked about how information infrastructures carry weight. These infrastructures are not apolitical and they can have a lot of consequences. Sometimes for good, like when you find a recipe on a weeknight quickly, sometimes for the bad, when the system breaks or when it is designed specifically to exploit some people and serve others. That's it for now. In the next lecture, we will take a more structural view of information ecologies to study the broader relations and impacts around information systems. Until then, stay informed and stay well. Peace. Peace.